Uh, and you are from Song Young Sky Academy, Institute of Science in Sweden. And you are uh, leading a group that are specifically studying antibiotic or antimicrobial resistance in the environment. Please, the chair is yours. Thank you very much. So, this one worked, right? Yes, good. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so I have the uh, privilege to talk to you today about the environmental dimensions of antibiotic resistance. And uh, I will mostly focus on what antibiotics in the environment do. And I'll also put some extra focus on some environments where I think risks are particularly big and I think there are some low-hanging fruits to pick also. So, the environment plays two roles in the development of antibiotic resistance. And the first is transmission or spread of the actual pathogens, those bacteria that cause disease. In many poor regions of the world, both human and animal feces are released untreated to waterways, which then carries back infections, just as Ulf mentioned and showed examples of. In fact, also pollution with uh, non-resistant bacteria and viruses uh, can contribute to resistance because they also increase infections and infections triggers the use and misuse of antibiotics which then triggers resistance. So anything that increases diseases increases actually antibiotic resistance. So transmission of bacteria through water is an important role of the environment but today I'll focus more on the other role of the environment in antibiotic resistance and that is the actual emergence of resistance in disease causing bacteria. So resistance in bacteria that cause disease is in most cases a, a relatively new phenomenon that has developed over the past 75 years or so when we have used antibiotics. But the genes that make the bacteria resistant to antibiotics, they are much, much older. So if we sequence DNA from soil that has been frozen for 30,000 years, like this one, permafrost, we find DNA from these guys just next to genes that make bacteria resistant to vancomycins, beta-lactams, tetracycline. They were there 30,000 years ago but not in pathogens, not in the bacteria that cause disease. So, as long as these genes stay in harmless environmental bacteria, that's no problem, we don't need to treat them. The problem arises when these genes, one by one, make this unfortunate jump into the bacterial pathogens. <coughs> that's when we really face a challenge. So, Note also that this transfer of genes, this only needs to take place at one time, at one place of our planet. Then you have opened Pandora's box and you cannot close it again. You cannot unmake a resistant bacteria. Once you have them, you have to live with them. The only thing you can do is try to limit spread, limit infections. So delaying this actual emergence or development of resistance is really important. So one thing we know also is that the emergence of resistance is promoted by a selection pressure from antibiotics. So where do these critical genetic transfer events of resistance genes to pathogens, where do they occur? Well the gut flora of animals and humans that are given antibiotics, they are very important places for the development of resistance. There, in the guts, the bacteria encounter sufficiently high concentrations of antibiotics to provide the resistant bacteria with a selective advantage so they can grow. But one thing that is often forgotten is that there are only certain types of bacteria that can thrive in our guts. This puts this limited number of species uh, puts a limitation on the number of different forms of resistance genes that can be recruited into pathogens. Only those that are present in the gut. 
But if we then move out to the much larger external environment, the bacterial diversity is huge. Here, there are most likely already bacteria that carry resistance genes to any antibiotic that mankind will ever develop. At least that's what we have learned from the past. All the resistance genes have been there all the time. They just jumped in to the pathogens. So in what external environments do we find sufficiently high concentrations of antibiotics to select for resistance? Well, in, in environments that are contaminated by human and animal use of antibiotics, we also find antibiotics, uh, but the concentrations are relatively low. In sewage treatment plants and in um, near, for example, aquaculture farming facilities, some, uh, concentrations can be a little bit higher, but it's still uncertain if these levels of antibiotics are sufficient to really promote resistance. You find resistant bacteria there, but they can also come from the poo, right? From the animals or humans that have been treated with the antibiotics. So it's a little bit difficult to know there. Might very well be so, but we don't know. But in environments that are polluted directly from the manufacturing of antibiotics, the concentrations can be much, much higher. So, for the past 10 years, we've studied an industrial area in India, Patanchero. And it serves as a major provider of antibiotics to the entire world. We find extremely high concentrations of different drugs here. Up to 30 milligrams per liter of the most common antibiotic, ciprofloxacin. 30 milligrams per liter. That is 10 times the concentrations you find in the blood of a patient taking medicines. That we find in waterways. This should be compared with the concentrations that uh, you find in environments that are polluted from excreted antibiotics, from the use of antibiotics. Here we talk about nanograms, milligrams or nanograms. Does that matter? It matters. So I just wanted you to reflect on what is the difference between milligrams and nanograms. This is about what the difference is. <laughs> this is one million times higher than that. That also reflects risks and the risks for resistance to develop. Think about that. Multi-resistant bacteria thrive like nowhere else in these environments due to the comparative advantage they get from the pollution with antibiotics. We've also shown that these multi-resistant bacteria are really good at transferring their resistance to human pathogens. You just put them together for a couple of hours and then they transfer the resistance to human pathogens. And unfortunately, is there are other places outside of India that looks very much like this one. So Nature wrote about our findings and they referred to it as India's drug problem. But is this really India's drug problem? I think of it as if it's everyone's problem, of at least two reasons. The first is that resistant bacteria travels just as fast as a jumbo jet. So to protect ourselves, we need to reduce risk that resistance develops also at the other side of the planet. And the other reason is more of a moral reason, because we in the Western world, we use the products that are produced here. So to me, it says that we have a shared moral responsibility to reduce discharges and not export the pollution to poorer countries. So what should we do about this then? Well, we need discharge limits for how much drugs a factory can discharge. Believe it or not, but this is still not the case. Not in India, not in China, not in Sweden, 
not in Europe, not in the USA. So, while such legislation develops, big buyers of medicines can also take responsibility and require standards above what's legally required. It shouldn't pay off for companies to take environmental shortcuts. So these views were highlighted by a recent commission from the former British Prime Minister and the report suggested that emission limits that we recently published uh, could be applied immediately worldwide. So with this I hope that I made you aware of risks not only about the use of antibiotics but there could be risks after use and before use of the antibiotics. So we need to think about the entire life cycle. And I'd like to uh, thank you for listening and bring your attention to a recently started Center for Antibiotic Resistance Research in Gothenburg who deals with these issues and other related AMR issues as well. Thank you. Thank you. What did the resistance gene do in the mammoth in the first place? They were not in the mammoth. I said that they were as old as the mammoth. We found resistance genes in 30,000 year old samples. Yeah. So they were there. They were there to protect the bacteria that carry them because other microorganisms produce antibiotic substances. So there's been a warfare between microorganisms for billions, for billions of years probably. That's why they have the resistance genes. The other question, you talk about moral responsibility to reduce um, but what is the moral responsibility of the companies that are producing them? Uh, they share a, a large portion of it, of it, of course. But I think that uh, anyone that can do something to the problem, they have moral responsibility. So it's not like you, you spill the coffee, you wipe it up. It's more about I can do something about it. Therefore, I have a moral responsibility also. And I think Sweden can play a role here. Because we are, I think, a little bit in the front of this and can fight this on a political agenda and make people aware of it and, and enforce regulations. Thanks. I don't know whether the, the, it was the moral responsibility that drove the Swedish farmer to take the actions that did, but anyhow, Maybe. you can you keep on, uh, on, on this theme of the, of the day, and you are welcome on the chair. Uh,